Welcome to Hood Politics. In this episode, I will be discussing blood on blood wars. The facts of the case are as follows. In 1969, Raymond Washington founded the Crips on the east side of South Central Los Angeles. In the following years, the Crips began to spread to places like the west side of South Central, Watts, Inglewood, Compton, West LA, Long Beach, and others. During the Crips expansion, they began to absorb other gangs, and gangs that went against the expansion became enemies of the Crips, such as the Brims, the Bishops, the Denver Lanes, the Athens Park Boys, the Chain Gang, the Piru Street Boys, and others. These gangs were all individually at war with the Crips, so in the 1970s, they held a meeting and formed an alliance. This alliance will be known as the Bloods. By the late 1970s, the Crips were at war with one another, with the most famous rivalry being the Rolling 60s Crips versus the A-Trey Gangster Crips. This war created a domino effect and essentially split the Crips, but it also made it the norm for Crips to kill Crips. And by the mid-1980s, most Crip gangs were at war with another Crip gang. The Bloods were also at war with the Crips, but they had something the Crips had long lost, unity. During that time, all Blood gang members were welcome in each other's hoods. When a blood was killed by a crip, multiple blood gangs would show up to his funeral. Even if they didn't personally know the individual, they would show up out of respect and love for another blood. The taking of Fremont High School was another example of blood unity. Fremont was a crip-dominated school, and blood gang members were not allowed to attend, and if they enrolled, they would be assaulted and forced to check out. One year, a large group of bloods decided to check into Fremont High and challenge the crips for control of the school. After many fights and even shootings, the the Bloods took control of Fremont High School, and even today, many still consider Fremont High a blood school. The unity, as well as the viciousness of the Bloods, allowed them to thrive and explode in membership, especially during the 1980s. One example would be the Swans. The Swans are a blood gang located on the east side of South Central. The Swans are literally surrounded by enemy Crip gangs, such as the East Coast Crips, the Avalon Garden Crips, the Kitchen Crips, the Main Street Crips, and others. The Swans went to war with all of the surrounding gangs and not only survived, but thrived and expanded their territory, ultimately becoming one of the biggest gangs in Los Angeles, both membership and territory-wise. There has been a debate regarding what was the first blood-on-blood -blood war. Some say it was in Inglewood, between the Crenshaw Mafia Bloods and the Inglewood neighborhood Pyrus, after Pyru members murdered a Crenshaw Mafia member named Tiptoe in the late 1990s. Like the N.A. Spleas, the neighborhood Pyrus, just pumps on me. My Tiptoe, that's my you know what I'm saying, M.I.P. So we doing it like that. And unfortunately, we had it with other dogs, but you know shit happens. We killing them up, just crush our mafias, you know? This my be tip. Others say it was in Compton, between the treetop Pyrus and the Compton neighborhood Pyrus. It's important to note that while some Pyru members do consider themselves bloods, some do not, so I mean no disrespect while generally speaking. So blood, Pyru, blood, Pyru, blood is different, blood. We burgundy, blood, we don't got no red, blood. I got red laces in my shoes, but they ain't nothing. You see this burgundy rag, this burgundy rag right here, blood. Our room bloods, two me? different things, you know what I'm saying? Bloods wear red. We got on red right now, but it's P-Funk, like you already know, but I still got the burgundy rag, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bloods do their thing, rules do their thing. But most agree that the first blood on blood war began on the east side of South Central, between the Pueblo Bishops and the Bloodstone Villains. Some date this rivalry back to the late 1990s, but everyone agrees that one incident put them on a warpath. On December 24, 2000, a 31-year-old man named Mark Eugene Black was found shot and killed near the intersection of Long Beach Boulevard and 52nd Street. Mark, also known as Do Dirty, was a beloved member of the Bloodstone Villains. The villains initially believed that a neighboring Latino gang called 38th Street was responsible, but members of 38th Street obtained a police report containing the circumstances of Mark's death. The police report cleared 38th Street, and as the villains learned more information about the murder, it became clear who was really responsible, the Pueblo bishops. The villains and the Pueblos had been close allies for decades. The two gangs had strong ties through family and were also bonded through war with the Crips. It was later discovered that Mark was murdered over drugs. His death led to a string of back and forth shootings between the villains and the Pueblos. Many reputable blood gang members from all over attempted to step in and end the feud, but their pleas for peace fell on deaf ears and the war continued. In one incident, on March 11, 2004, around 6.30 p.m., a 19-year-old man named Mr. Mishaw was shot and killed at Slauson Park. 
Slauson Park is located in Pueblo territory. Detectives arrived at the scene and began their investigation. A detective named Tommy Thompson was the lead investigator of Mr.'s murder. On the day of the murder, Thompson interviewed a man named Joseph. Joseph stated that he was at Slauson Park at the time of the shooting. He went on to say that a young kid named Boo Boo told him that Xavier and DeMonte from Five Deuce Bloodstone Villains were the shooters. According to Joseph, Boo Boo's real name was Ramon and he had been playing with Joseph's two sons at the park's recreation center at the time of the shooting. Thompson used the gang database to determine that Xavier's full name was Cleo Xavier Stanley. On March 14th, three days after the shooting, Thompson interviewed Ramon. Initially, Ramon was reluctant to talk, but he eventually admitted to seeing Xavier shoot Mr. Thompson also interviewed a woman named Dinesha. Dinesha stated that she saw two black males wearing hooded sweatshirts approach the park and shoot into another group of men. Dinesha's mother Wanda was also present during the interview and both of them expressed reluctance about getting involved with the investigation. When Dinesha was shown a photographic lineup, she picked out Xavier's picture, stating that he had the same complexion and same type of sweatshirt as the shooter. On April 28, 2004, Thompson interviewed Mr.'s brother, Harmon. Harmon also stated that Ramon told him that he'd seen Xavier and DeMonte from the villains shoot Mr. Harmon was also reluctant to get involved with the investigation, but he later signed a statement regarding what Ramon told him about the shooting. A while later, Thompson brought Xavier in for an interview. Xavier stated that he was nowhere near the park on the day of the shooting. However, after investigators falsely told him that he had been captured on video taken at the park during the time of the shooting, he changed his story. He told investigators that he was on drugs, walking towards the recreation center when he heard the shooting and ran away. Evidence indicated that Mr. was associated with the Pueblo bishops and that Xavier was a member of the rival Bloodstone villains. Cleo Xavier Stanley was charged with first-degree murder for the death of Mr. Meshaw, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. He later pled not guilty. During the trial, all of the witnesses recanted their statements. Ramon, Joseph, Dinesha, and Harmon all refused to cooperate. Harmon told the court that he only signed the statement because he hadn't read it beforehand. Harmon was so reluctant to testify that he only appeared in court after officers went to his house and escorted him to the courtroom. An investigator in the case took the stand and told the court that witnesses refusing to speak at gang murder trials isn't rare. He went on to tell the court that snitches are beaten up or even killed, and as a result, many refuse to testify in gang-related cases. The court agreed with the investigator and took account of the witnesses' initial statements to detectives, including Dinesha picking Xavier out of a photographic lineup. The prosecutor the prosecution also presented Xavier's statements to investigators as evidence. They displayed the contradiction in him initially denying being near the recreation center and then admitting to being near the recreation center. The gang expert told the court about the rivalry between the Bloodstone villains and the Pueblo bishops and how Xavier would gain status within the Bloodstone villains by firing into a group of rival Pueblo bishops. Ultimately, Cleo Xavier Stanley was found guilty with the murder of Mr. Meshaw as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Cleo Xavier Stanley was sentenced to 60 years to life in prison. In another incident, on April 10th, 2005, around 7.30 p.m., a woman named Shantae was talking with her sister-in-law and another woman named Shanae in front of a house on East 56th Street. The home was located in Bloodstone Villain territory. A 34-year-old man named Leandre Hewitt was standing nearby having a conversation with another man. Shortly afterwards, a white car occupied by three men drove towards them slowly. The front seat passenger was sitting on the window frame. He then pulled out a gun and opened fire towards the people on the street. After the shooting, the vehicle sped away. When the smoke cleared, Shantae and Shanae were shot, but they survived. Leandre was shot in the chest and later died from his wound. Detectives arrived at the scene and began their investigation. They recovered several bullet fragments from the scene of the shooting, but they found no bullet casings. They figured the murder weapon was a revolver because a semi-automatic gun would have ejected casings. Investigators then learned that the bullet recovered from Shantae and the bullet recovered from Leandre were not fired from the same gun and believed there had to be two shooters, both using revolvers. During the investigation, detectives spoke to a woman named Maria. Maria lived a few blocks away from the scene of the shooting. She heard gunshots and shortly afterwards saw a car stop nearby. The two passengers got out of the car and started running. Maria saw a part of a gun in the rear passenger's waistband. 
on April 13th, three days after the shooting, police responded to a reports of shots fired and arrested a man who would be referred to as RC. RC led police to another location where a man named Dion was talking to a man named Antonio. When Dion saw the police approaching, he yelled to Antonio and Antonio ran towards a nearby garage and threw a gun under a car. Police recovered the gun. It was a 38 caliber revolver. Investigators later found that the revolver was used in the shooting on 56th Street. RC was a member of the Oriental Boys gang and Dion and Antonio were members of the Pablo Bishops. The Pablo Bishops occupy a housing project called Pablo del Rio as well as the surrounded streets. The Oriental Boys are a predominantly Cambodian gang and claim the same territory as the Pablo Bishops. The two gangs are on good terms. RC told investigators that he had information about the shooting on 56th Street. He heard a man named James Jackson talking to another man named Michael Mitchell about having a fist fight with someone named KO. James said, let's go take it out on the villains. James and Michael left close to nightfall and they were each carrying revolvers. The next day, RC overheard Michael and James talking about a shooting they had committed. According to RC, James said they seen a couple of people standing outside. He went on to say that they saw a man peeing while they exited the car and approached on foot. When the man finished peeing, James opened fire on him while Michael opened fire on the other group of people. James and Michael then warned the others present to be on the lookout for retaliatory attacks by the villains. Also on April 13th, investigators spoke to another Oriental Boys member who will be referred to as RJ. RJ told police he knew about the shooting on 56th Street and he knew something about someone getting shot in the chest. RJ said two days earlier, he was in the projects and heard James say he caught someone slipping and got him in the chest. Investigators paid Maria a follow-up visit and showed her a photographic lineup containing Michael's photo. Maria identified Michael as the man who exited the front passenger seat and two weeks later, she was shown another photographic lineup and identified James as the man who exited the rear passenger seat. James Jackson and Michael Mitchell were later arrested and charged with first degree murder for the death of Leandre Hewitt. They were also charged with two counts of attempted murder for the shootings of Shantae and Shanae, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Both men pled not guilty. The gang expert during the trial was a police officer named Gerald Harden. Harden said he knew James and Michael as members of the Pablo Bishops and that the Peblos were bitter rivals of the villains. He went on to say that the two gangs once got along, but ever since a dispute over drugs and money caused the shooting, it's been basically an all-out war. The villains claim 56th Street as part of their territory. The Swans are a blood gang located a few blocks south of villain territory. The Swans and the villains have been close allies for decades, and it's not uncommon to find them hanging out in each other's hoods. Leandre was a Swan gang member. Hardin told the court that a Pablo Bishop member would gain status within the gang if he ventured into Bloodstone Villain territory and committed a shooting. Witness statements from RC, RJ, and others were used during the trial, but the statements Maria made during the trial contradicted the statements she initially made to investigators. Maria initially identified Michael as the man who exited the front passenger seat and James as the man who exited the rear passenger seat, but at trial, Maria identified Michael as the man who exited the rear passenger seat and said that James only looked familiar. The defense did not present any evidence during the trial. Ultimately, James Jackson and Michael Mitchell were found guilty with the murder of Leandre Hewitt and the attempted murders of Shantae and Shanae, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Michael Mitchell was sentenced to life, plus 75 years in prison. James Jackson was also sentenced to life, plus 75 years in prison. It's been said that the war between the Pueblo Bishops and the Bloodstone Villains made Bloods killing Bloods acceptable. Something that older Bloods viewed as a sin had now become the norm. Centennial is a Compton High School dominated by Piru and Blood Gangs. The school is located on the southeast corner of Central Avenue and El Segundo Boulevard, which is the territory of Westside Piru. Piru and Blood Gang members from all over attended Centennial, and although some of the gangs were rivals on the streets, it usually wouldn't go further than a fistfight, but one day, that all changed. On the afternoon of June 14, 2007, a young woman named Ishanit was attending a Centennial High School graduation ceremony with a group of friends. As the group was leaving the campus, one of Ishanit's friends named Don Shea began to argue with two other young women named Angela and Lakeisha. As the argument progressed, Angela challenged Don Shea to a fist fight. Ishanit and her group of friends walked to a nearby bus stop, which was located on the corner of Central Avenue and El Segundo Boulevard. The bus would take them 
went from there to the Nickerson Gardens area. Shortly afterwards, a group of nine or ten young men joined a Shanice group at the bus stop. Several members of the group were affiliated with the Bounty Hunter Bloods. The Bounty Hunters are a Watts gang that occupies the Nickerson Gardens projects as well as the surrounding streets. Among the group was a 15-year-old young man named Devon Harris. Harris, also known as Poo Poo, was a 10th grader at Centennial High School. At the time, a Golden Bird restaurant sat across the street from the bus stop. A group of Westside Piru members were in the restaurant's parking lot. A shouting match ensued between the two groups. Some of the boys at the bus stop shouted Nickerson Gardens and Bounty Hunters. In response, Westside Pyrus told the group they could take it to nearby Enterprise Park. The bus arrived, and Ishanid and the others took the bus to Central Avenue and 114th Street. The group exited the bus and began walking towards the Nickerson Gardens. Most of the boys walked ahead, while the girls and the rest of the boys, including Devon, walked behind. Shortly afterwards, a Chevy Tahoe came to a screeching halt on 114th Street. Ishanit remembered seeing the same Tahoe earlier in the Golden Bird parking lot, and she recognized the person sitting in the front seat. She knew him as Deuce and had seen him on prior occasions at Centennial High School. She then saw Deuce point a gun at her group and open fire. She heard eight or nine shots as she and the others ran and ducked for cover. The Tahoe then sped away. When the smoke cleared, Ishanit and her friends regrouped and found that Devon had been shot in the head. Devon was taken to UCLA Harbor Medical Center, where he was pronounced brain dead. Devon was kept on the ventilator. Family, friends, and 11 teachers and administrators from Centennial High School stopped by the hospital to see him. Devon's mother held a vigil for him in the Nickerson Gardens and at the hospital. Devon was kept alive long enough for six of his organs to be donated to six people. On June 17, 2007, Devon Harris was taken off life support. On June 20th, six days after the shooting, detectives arrested a young man named Derek Washington and his sister Angela at their grandmother's house and transported them to the police station. Angela was questioned first. Afterwards, she was allowed to speak with Derek alone. Then they questioned Derek separately and afterwards let him speak to Angela and his aunts alone. Angela and Derek interrogations as well as their conversations with each other were recorded. During Angela's interrogation, she said on the afternoon of the shooting, her and her friend Lakeisha argued with Don Shea as they left the graduation ceremony at Centennial. As members of the bounty hunter sat at the bus stop, Angela and Lakeisha were across the street in the Golden Bird parking lot with the Piru members. Angela said Lakeisha was a member of Westside Piru, but she herself was not. Lakeisha then walked into the middle of the street and began antagonizing the bounty hunters. The bounty hunters began taking off their shirts, preparing to fight. Angela recalled a bounty hunter member named Mike Mike doing all the talking. He said that his homegirl from the Nickerson Gardens, referring to Don Shea, was going to fight Lakeisha, and if she did fight, he was also going to fight. He then challenged the Pyrus to meet them at Enterprise Park. The Pyrus agreed. Mike Mike then told Angela, we spent on girls too. A few minutes later, the bounty hunters and the others from the Nickerson Gardens got on the bus. The Piru members attempted to leave in their cars, but they were detained by police. Officers had received a call saying that the Westside Pyrus were going to shoot up the graduation. Shortly afterwards, Angela saw Derek on the street near the Golden Bird. Another Piru member named Jason Keaton drove his Chevy Tahoe out of the Golden Bird parking lot and asked Derek if he wanted a ride to the hood. Derek said yes and got into the front passenger seat. Jason then made a U-turn and began following the bus. Later that evening, Angela heard that Derek killed Devon, who she knew as Poo Poo. That same night, Angela was sitting in the car with some of her friends when Derek arrived. He told them that he killed Devon. He went on to say that he and Jason had followed the bus and watched as people got off. The people from the bus were walking down an alley towards the Nickerson Gardens. Jason then drove down the alley, but Derek believed he had been recognized, so they left and came back. As they drove down the alley for a second time, while playing loud music, Devon walked towards the Tahoe, and some of the others had their hands on their waistbands, posturing as if they had guns. Derek said he felt like they were going to shoot him so he shot first and tried to hit Mike Mike and another bounty hunter member named 211 but Mike Mike ducked and the bullet struck Devon. Derek went on to tell the group that he shot the wrong boy. Derek told Angela that he was drunk and high and Jason already had the gun in the car and that Jason urged him to shoot. According to Angela, Jason needed to earn his stripes as a Westside Piru member. She went
went on to say that he was a nothing over there, meaning he was a low-level member that hadn't earned the respect of his fellow Pyru members, and he may have believed that the shooting would increase his status within the gang. Shortly after questioning Angela, detectives brought Derek into the interrogation room. Detectives told him that Angela had already told them everything regarding the shooting. Derek denied committing the shooting. He also denied knowing Jason and being in the Tahoe. After Derek's interrogation, he was left in the room with Angela again. He told Angela that she shouldn't have told them anything. Angela told him he shouldn't have lied about knowing Jason. Derek replied that he messed up and was facing life. Angela told him that she was on probation and she wasn't going down for whatever he did. She went on to say that she told the truth and was going home. She then urged him to also tell the truth. As Angela was leaving the room, Derek told her to tell everyone outside that he loves them. Shortly afterwards, detectives interrogated Derek again. This time, he chose to tell them his version of events. Derek told detectives that on the afternoon of the shooting, he was at his grandmother's house when he received a call saying that Angela was about to fight some project boys in reference to the group from the Nickerson Gardens. He then retrieved his 45 caliber pistol that he had stashed in the backyard and made his way towards Centennial. When he arrived, he witnessed a group of his friends exchanging words with the other group across the street at the bus stop. The bus arrived and as the other group boarded, they told the Pyrus they were coming back. He went on to say that one of his friends picked him up and drove him to the Nickerson Gardens. He didn't intend on shooting anyone, he just wanted to see what the other group was going to do. He saw the group exit the bus and walk towards the Nickerson Gardens. His friend then drove down the alley while playing loud music. The group looked at the car and recognized them because they all went to school together. Derek said the group was holding their belt buckles and had their hands in their shirts. There was another group behind the car and he thought he would have to shoot it out because it was them or us. He had his gun on his lap. He cocked it and put in the clip. Derek said Devon began walking towards the vehicle. Derek said he knew Devon because they had played basketball together. A few moments later, Derek opened fire and saw Devon fall about six feet away. The crowd scattered and hid, but some continued to walk towards the car and he believed they had guns, so he continued to fire, emptying his clip, which held between 18 and 21 rounds. Derek went on to say that he couldn't believe what he had done. After the shooting, Derek gave the gun to a friend to get rid of. He admitted to telling Angela and her friends about the shooting and then told them to stop talking about it. Neighborhood OGs told Derek that he broke the code, saying that he had done it wrong and that the neighborhood was hot, meaning the territory of Westside Piru was experiencing an increased police presence due to the shooting and possible retaliation by the bounty hunters. Derek had also heard that people from the projects wanted to kill him. Derek denied being a member of Westside Piru, but stated all of his family were from the gang. He went on to say that his uncles told him they had did enough for the gang and he did not have to wear their colors. Derek Washington was charged with first degree murder for the death of Devon Harris, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. He later pled not guilty. During the trial, the prosecution presented a stack of evidence against Derek, including evidence of a January 2006 encounter with police when Derek admitted to being a Westside Piru member and told officers that he goes by the nickname YG Tiny. The detectives that interrogated Derek testified that he told them that he was from Westside Piru and the Pyrus and bounty hunters would meet at Enterprise Park every year around Centennial's graduation to fight. Investigators testified that three 45 caliber casings were found at the scene and all were fired from the same gun. Investigators also played the recording of Derek's interrogation for the jury. The gang expert for the case was a Los Angeles County Sheriff named Frederick Morse. Morse testified that Westside Piru were enemies of the bounty hunters. He went on to say that he believed the murder was committed for the benefit of Westside Piru. The defense cited self-defense in the case. Derek told the court that he went to the Golden Bird to protect his sister after being notified that she was going to fight. He went on to say that he was walking back to his grandparents' house when Jason offered him a ride. He admitted that they did follow the bus, but only to see if the bounty hunters would return with guns, and there was no prior discussion of where they were going or retaliation against the bounty hunters. Derek testified that when the Tahoe stopped at the apron of the alley, a black gun appeared on his lap and he was shot. He went on to say that he opened fire because he believed that his life was in danger, although he admitted to never actually seeing anyone with a gun. Ultimately, Derek Washington was found guilty with the murder of Devon Harris, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Derek Washington was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. Nine years after Devon's murder, his family was struck with tragedy a second time. 
On Sunday, July 17, 2016, around 7.30 p.m., a 30-year-old man named DeAndre Hughes was standing in the yard talking to another person. Shortly afterwards, two men approached him from the street and opened fire. The two shooters then got into a white sedan and fled the scene. DeAndre was shot and taken to a hospital. At 7.53 p.m., DeAndre was pronounced dead. DeAndre was Devon's older brother and went by the nickname Speedy. In 2018, a man was charged with DeAndre's murder, but those charges were later dropped. In January of 2022, the city of Los Angeles announced a $50,000 reward for information, but to this day, DeAndre's murder remains unsolved. In another incident on Saturday, February 9th, 2013, members of the Denver Lane Bloods and the Inglewood Family Bloods went to the Normandy Casino in the nearby city of Gardena. The Denver Lanes and the Inglewood families have been on good terms for decades. A short while later, an argument broke out between the two groups and a fistfight ensued. After the fight, the Denver Lanes and the families both left the casino and went their separate ways. A few hours later, on February 10th, a 25-year-old man named Trevani Odom was shot and killed near the intersection of Denver Avenue and 109th Place, which is considered the heart of Denver Lane territory. Trevani was a beloved member of the Denver Lanes and went by the nicknames Tiny D-Bone and KS. KS meaning Kill a Salo in reference to the 107 Hoovers, who are longtime enemies of the Denver Lanes. The Lanes quickly discovered who was responsible for Trevani's murder, the Inglewood families. Two days after Trevani's murder, on February 12th, a 46-year-old man named Clarence Gant was shot and killed on 126th Street. Clarence was a beloved member of the Inglewood families and went by the nickname Big Clayron. He was a well-respected member and viewed as a leader within the gang. The day after Clarence's murder, on February 13th, a 30-year-old man named Darnell Charles was riding his bike near the intersection of Menlo Avenue and Imperial Highway when someone on foot chased him into traffic and opened fire. The shooter then ran to a champagne-colored Toyota Camry and fled the scene. Darnell was shot three times in the back and died of his wounds. A witness described the shooter as being 5 foot 10 to 6 foot 1 tall with a medium build. He had a short afro and wore glasses. Darnell's murder took place in Denver Lane's territory. Two days after Darnell's murder, on February 15th, shortly after 9 p.m., a 19-year-old man named Tyrone Robinson was talking with his friend, Leon, near the intersection of Vermont Avenue and Imperial Highway. A few moments later, a man approached the two men. He asked Leon where he was from. Leon replied that he was from Texas. The man then asked Tyrone where he was from, but before Tyrone could reply, the man put out a gun and opened fire, striking Tyrone. As Tyrone laid on the ground, the man stood over him and shot him again. The shooter then walked to a black Yukon and fled the scene. Tyrone was rushed to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. Tyrone was wearing red and was murdered in Denver Lane's territory. Detectives arrived at the scene and began their investigation. They found that multiple witnesses were able to write down the Yukon's license plate number. Investigators were also able to pull surveillance footage from a nearby liquor store, which showed the shooter exit the vehicle, walk south on Vermont Avenue, fire a gun, and return to the vehicle. Investigators showed another surveillance video of the shooting to a former Inglewood police officer named Brandon Wilkes. Wilkes identified the shooter as a man named Donnie Walton Jr. Donnie was a member of the Inglewood family bloods and Wilkes had known him for over 20 years. Investigators also discovered that the Yukon was registered to Clarence and located the vehicle in Clarence's backyard. Donnie's fingerprints were found on and inside of the vehicle. Investigators questioned Clarence's son, who was also named Clarence Gant, but went by the nicknames Baby Clarence and CJ. They found that Donnie borrowed the truck shortly after Clarence's murder, and he also borrowed CJ's cell phone. Donnie's phone pinged on a cell tower near the scene of Darnell's murder, and CJ's phone pinged on a cell tower near the scene of Tyrone's murder. CJ was later placed in a monitored cell with two undercover law enforcement officials. CJ told the men that investigators had shown him a picture of his big homie, and they also had video of his big homie at the gas station near the scene of Tyrone's murder. Investigators believed CJ used the phrase big homie in reference to Donnie due to Donnie being an older member of the gang. Investigators initially believed that CJ was also 
people involved with the murder, but didn't have enough evidence to support that theory. Donnie Walton Jr. was arrested and charged with two counts of first degree murder for the deaths of Darnell Charles and Tyrone Robinson, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Donnie later pled not guilty. During the trial, the prosecution presented a stack of evidence against Donnie. A witness at the scene of Darnell's murder identified Donnie as the shooter. Donnie's cell phone pinged on a cell tower near the scene of Darnell's murder. Donnie borrowed the Yukon and the vehicle's license plate number was reported by multiple witnesses at the scene of Tyrone's murder. A woman named Asia identified Donnie when shown images from the surveillance video. Asia had known Donnie for over 10 years and shares a child with him. The forensics expert found that the same gun was used in both Darnell and Tyrone's murders, but no weapon was ever recovered. The gang expert during the trial was an Inglewood police officer named Samuel Bailey. Bailey detailed the rivalry between the Inglewood families and the Denver Lanes. Bailey testified that within a week of the fight at the casino, there had been nine shootings and five murders between the gangs. He went on to say that he believes the murders were committed for the benefit of the Inglewood families. Ultimately, Donnie Walton Jr. was found guilty with the murders of Darnell Charles and Tyrone Robinson, as well as gun and gang enhancement charges. Donnie Walton was sentenced to six life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 65 years to life in prison. Eight years after Clarence's murder, the Gantt family would experience another loss. On Friday, April 23rd, 2021, at around 12.20 p.m., CJ was shot and killed on Albruta Street in Compton. These have been just a handful of incidents that have taken place between the Bloods. Many of their original Blood and Pyru members have gone on record stating that they hate what's happening, but they believe that the unity and love that they once shared is gone forever. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe.